and we go a little bit further in the uh, processing Thank analysis you. interpretation. And as Mathieu already mentioned also, there's currently this kind of really wave which is initiated by companies like Google and so on where a huge amount of data is available and then actually it seems that techniques that have been developed years and years ago like neural networks and things like that, it's like once you have both enough data and enough computing power, it seems like you can get really, really nice results. And so this whole machine learning business is starting to become extremely popular in such a way that even also as Mathieu uh, uh, mentioned already, everything goes into the direction that you need to do machine learning and that the understanding is not always the most important anymore. And I'm really happy to uh, introduce Gemma Pieja, who is a professor here in the university, and she's working on these techniques and luckily she's also working in the more smart way, is trying to see what is really the value of these tools compared to just trying to use it everywhere. Please, Gemma. Hello, so I'm going to talk uh, about machine learning, uh, some basic concepts, and then at the end of the talk I will, I, uh, I will give some cardiac uh, examples on how we can apply it. So, uh, machine learning aims at extracting knowledge directly from data uh, by learning from experience. This is very useful in medical applications because uh, we deal with tasks and data which are complex and of high dimensionality. So the typical uh, human-generated rule-based heuristics usually are not appropriate. Um, with uh, machine learning, uh, we learn from futures and uh, so that we are able to uh, um, we are able to extract knowledge for knowledge discovery and data mining and also to make predictions about new data and this uh, is very useful for example for computer guided diagnosis or to support clinical uh, decisions so uh, the terminology of machine learning was already used in the 50s, but perhaps one of the most standard definitions is the one given by Tom Mitchell at the end of the 90s, which says that uh, machine learning concerns algorithms uh, that automatically improve uh, their performance at some task through experience. So for example, uh, learning to play chess, the test would be to play chess. The learning experience could be the opportunity to, play, uh, to gain practice by playing against oneself. And the performance measure could be the percentage of game that uh, the program wants against opponents. So a learning task is well defined by this triplet, task, experience, and performance. So let's Let's uh, see a little bit uh, each of them. About the task, well, it's important to say that the learning is not the task itself. Eh? And also, but it's the, um, let's say it's the, a, it's the tool to, to attain this task. Also, it's important to, to understand that we are not going to program the computer to do the task, but to learn to do the task. So. There are examples of tasks. Perhaps one of the most typical tasks is classification, where we have a fixed number of uh, levels or categories, and the, um, the program is asked to assign to each of the inputs one of these uh, levels. For example, here we have uh, some samples which uh, represent tumors, uh, which can be benign in blue or malignant in red. And we see that just by looking at uh, their size and the age of the patient, we can distinguish them. Of course, this is a toy example, and in reality is much more complicated, but uh, it illustrates uh, what classification is. Another popular task is regression, which tries to predict an output, a continuous output, given some input. For example, um, if we have, uh, here we, ha mm, we are giving, uh, where is the, ah, here. Yeah, here we are giving some sample, uh, which we have the um, body mass index, 
and the corresponding cholesterol. No? So uh, what we would like to do is given a new patient um, with, uh, if we know which is uh, his uh, body mass index, we could predict the cholesterol. And a very simple way to do it, it's just to try to fit a straight line um, which fits the, the samples. Perhaps these are the two tasks more typical in, in machine learning, but there are many other, like for example, uh, trying to detect associations, or trying to detect anomalies, or clustering, denoising, etc. Okay, so the experience has to do with the data that we have and the previous knowledge. Um, basically, we can distinguish between supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms depending on which experience the, the algorithm is allowed to have during the learning. So in a supervised, in a supervised uh, learning, we have some, I, sorry, we are giving, we are given some, some input features together with the corresponding levels. And we determine which is the model or function which maps these uh, features to the level. And then what we are going to, and once um, we have learned this, this model, we are going to use it to map new features to, um, to the output. This is in contrast with uh, the unsupervised learning approach where we do not have any specific prior knowledge. So the algorithm has to, let's say, explore the data and try to find some kind of a structure. And this can be done, for example, by clustering the data based on the uh, relationships among the variables. And, okay. And finally, uh, well, just to mention about this, that um, many times we, the tasks are um, typically supervised tasks are, for example, classification and regression, and a typical unsupervised learning task is, for example, clustering. And then we have the performance, which usually is specific to the task. For example, if you want to classify, a uh, possible performance measure to do is the classification error rate or the accuracy. What it is important to notice is that we want the learning algorithm to perform well on previously unseen samples. Eh? So this, this ability to perform well on, on new samples is what is called generalization. So we are going to split our data set in two we are going to have a training set, which we are going to use to learn the model. And then we are going to have a test set that we are going to use to evaluate our model. But, uh, uh, okay. And then, um, of course, during the training set, uh, what we are going to say, we can compute an error measure, which is called the training error. And we are going, what we are going to do is to fit the model so that this training error is minimized. So this is a kind of optimization problem. But what is different from just an optimization problem is that we want also this test error or generalization error to be small. But of course, in practice, um, we do not have, uh, well, we do not always have um, the, the, the means to evaluate this um, test error. Mm -hmm. Either because we don't have, we don't know about which are the, uh, the new samples we are going to have, or because we do not have the ground truth. So what uh, it's done is uh, we split this training set into one which is going to use for the training of, uh, for the learning of the model, and the other one which is going to use uh, to test the model during the training phase. And this uh, validation, uh, this set, which is called the validation set, is going to provide us with some kind of estimation of the, the test error on how it uh, generally generalized on new, on an independent um, uh, data set. 
and it also will uh, help to prevent problems like overfitting, which I will talk afterwards. And also, it can be used to tune some of the parameters of our model. For example, if we are using, if we want to use a regression model, we can use the training set to tune the weights, to fit the weights of the regression model, and the validation set to decide if we are going to use a linear or a quadratic uh, model. Or, for example, if we want to use a, ne a neural network, we can use the training set to tune the weights, to find the weights of the neuron, and the validation set to decide about how many layers this, uh, this, convolution, this uh, neural network should have. Okay, but this is splitting in two. The training set and the validation set has a disadvantage. And it's that, of course, now I'm, I'm training on a data set which is smaller. And this could yield to a model which mm, does not uh, perform so well. And also, uh, the fact that the, that the error uh, can vary a lot depending on how I do this, this splitting. So, in fact, in practice, what is done is what is called cross-validation, which consists in uh, partitioning the data into complementary sets. So that uh, each time I use one part of this data as a training set and the other as a validation set. For example, in a 10-fold cross-validation, I would do 10 iterations. In the first iteration, I would take the first 10% as the validation set and the remaining 90 as the, uh, for the training. On the second iteration, the next 10% for validation and the remaining 90 for the training, and so on, up to 10. And then once I have all these iteration, I would compute the validation error as the average of all uh, 10 uh, validation errors. Okay. okay, so we have seen now how to define the learning task, the task, the experience, and the performance measure. measure. And um, another important issue is about uh, the data that we are going to work with, the how, uh, which is the data, and also how to represent it. And uh, just to give some examples for, for target application, we could work, for example, with images, either directly with pixel intensities, but also looking for more structure-like texture. We could work with shapes, either with uh, global parameters like volume or more local like the regional thickness or curvature or even more complicated like uh, meshes or, or fibers. And of course, we can also work with other type of functions. No? In the case of, of cardiac, uh, we could work with motion, velocity, deformations, and also, like I didn't put it here, uh, other clinical data, like for example, um, the age of the patient, the sex, if it's a smoker or non-smoker, all this kind of clinical data. Mm -hmm. Not only is it important to know with uh, which data we are going to work with, but also it's very important uh, to know how I'm going to represent this data. Because uh, the performance of most of of machine learning algorithms depends a lot on how this data is represented. This is just a, a toy example. Here, I, here we have the, the, same, the same data, just is represented in two different ways. On the left, uh, we have the data represented in Cartesian coordinates, and on the right, on, on polar coordinates. And if the task is to separate them by a straight line, I cannot do it with the representation of on the left, while it's very easy with the representation of on the right. So basically, when I have to decide how to represent my data, I have two basic approaches. Either I tell the computer what to look for, and this is what is called hand-designed features representation, or I let the computer 
I learned, I left the program to learn about which is the best representation. And this is what is called representation learning. In other words, apply machine learning to find the best representation for a given task. <clears throat> and then also another important concept is the concept of depth. No, the, the possibility to use several layers, either in the representation or also in the learning, um, to go from simple to complex. And this is what uh, also is related to what is called deep learning. So in this next slide, I summarize a little bit. So here on, on the left, you have uh, what would be a non-machine learning approach where uh, given an input, I told the, the computer program what to look for and what and how to do the task. Mm -hmm. Then I would have uh, machine learning, no? where uh, I give the I, I give the computer the, the features uh, what to look at, but I let the program to learn about how to do the task. Mm -hmm. And finally. If I let the computer to learn also about how to represent the features, I would have the representation learning. Mm -hmm. So now the learning is learning features and learning also how to do the task. And if I put several layers here, so I can construct more uh, abstract and, and complex uh, representation and task, then I would have what it, it is called deep learning. Okay, so, so mm, let's look now at what are the basic steps when trying to use the machine learning algorithm. Once we have seen it's to define the learning task and uh, in particular the, the learning experience, no? so the data that we are going to work with. Another is um, to uh, to, cho to make some, some choices about the implementation. Specifically, we have to, cho to, to select what model we want to use, for example, if it's a regression model or a neural network. We want also uh, to choose uh, the learning algorithm, and this amounts to choosing uh, which is the cost function, which I'm going to minimize, and uh, which optimization procedure I'm going to use. Then there is the training algorithm, which basically consists in uh, minimize this. Uh, I'm going to, f to fit this model to the training data by minimizing this cost function. And once I have learned the model, I'm going to test it. Mm -hmm. So for example, no? if uh, let's assume that we want to predict cholesterol from the broad mass index, and we are given some, some samples. Um, so I can decide that um, I want to use a linear regression model. So this, uh, I'm going to predict the cholesterol uh, given my, uh, the body mass index of the patient. Yeah? And um, what I have to do is just to estimate these parameters, theta 0 and theta 1. So it's the intercept of the line and the, and the slope. And uh, we can do it by minimizing, the, for example, the mean square error of uh, the training samples. No? So I compute the mean square error of the predicted uh, cholesterol with my ground truth. And uh, in order to minimize this cost function, I could use, for example, a gradient descent technique. Mm -hmm. OK, so these are the, basically the main steps that you have to take into account when building a machine learning algorithm. And of course, there are many issues uh, which also have to take into account. No? So we have seen that in order to define the learning task, of course, we have to understand which is our problem and um, which features I'm going to work with and how I'm going to represent them. Mm -hmm. Then I have to, to, do, to choose the model mm -hmm. and the learning algorithm. The question is which methods to use. 
while there are no single method, no single method that works for everything, but uh, it's very useful before trying anything to observe which is my data, no? which is the data that I have. And sometimes just doing simple statistics can provide us with, with a hint of what is happening. No? So uh, just by computing the average and the variability, uh, it can give us a lot of information. And then, of course, um, we have to think gradually and seeing if I need to go for a nonlinear approach or not, if I need to go for uh, deep architecture or not. Mm -hmm. And then about the training and testing, uh, there are also a lot of decisions that uh, a lot of issues that we have to take care of, like for example, is overfitting, or if I have enough data to learn an efficient model. Now, what I'm so we already talked about this about the features. Uh, in the next slide, I will talk a little bit about what is overfitting, and uh, afterwards I will talk about um, some basic methods. You can interrupt me if, if you have any doubt. Yeah? And finally, what is also, of course, very important is once we have uh, our results, let's try to interpret them and how we can use them for our purpose. OK, so what is overfitting? Well, overfitting occurs when I have my model, um, which is ex extremely fit to my training data, so that uh, it's unable to generalize. So I can have a very, very small training error, but the testing, uh, because it's not able to generalize, I will have a large error. On, well, on the other extreme would be the underfitting, where my model is too general, so it doesn't fit well to my training, er to my training data, and uh, this means that my training error is going to be, to be also high. Of course, what we would like to do is to arrive to a best balance. No? So having a small training error and also having a small testing error. One way to, to control the overfitting is um, if, uh, through the complexity or the capacity of the model. When my model is too complex to the problem that I have uh, at hand, then uh, usually it overfits. Mm -hmm. It uh, extremely fits to my data. And then, the, um, oh, although I have a very small training error, my generalization error is too large. And on the other hand, if my model is uh, too simple, then it will not fit my training data, and I will have also a large training error. So I have to try to, to, to work to choose the model uh, with the right complexity to my task. And one way to do that is by reducing the number of input features. Also, another way to do, to do it is by regularization. So we, we keep the features, but we make them to be small. Okay. And, and let's talk now about uh, a method. <clears throat> and perhaps one of the um, techniques which is mm, mostly used in machine learning is dimensionality reduction. The dimensionality reduction it's, uh, consists in finding a new representation which is low dimensional and which allows a more efficient processing of the data. No? For example, in here it's just a toy example, but we have a Swiss ball which is three dimensional and we can simplify this by just unfolding it and putting it into dimensional. Of course, uh, in practice, we are interested in, in problems when this D is very, very large, and then I can find a compact representation, a simplified representation, where D is much more smaller than the original um, dimensionality. Um, there are many ways, uh, there are many methods uh, to perform dimensionality reduction. Perhaps one of the simplest and most popular is principal component analysis. Principal component analysis is a linear 
orthogonal transform, which uh, transform my input data onto a new space of coordinates, so that the, um, the direction with the greatest variance comes to lie on the first coordinate, the second direction with the greatest variance comes to lie on the second direction, and so on. So it's a unsupervised learning technique, and because it's a way of representing the data, it could be also considered as a representation learning technique. Um, from the mathematical point of view, it's very easy to compute these um, principal modes, these principal lines of, of variation. We just have to center the data, and then compute the covariance matrix, and um, by diagonalizing it, we could compute the etching vectors, which are, in fact, the, the, the directions of uh, main variation. Because it's a way of representing the data that best explains uh, the variance, it's uh, perhaps one of the most popular variability analysis methods. Eh? And uh, if I just keep the first few dimensions, uh, then I'm simplifying my, my original data and I'm doing a kind of dimensionality reduction. Another method is linear discriminant analysis, which is also in some sense is similar to principal component analysis, but here we explicitly uh, look for the directions that uh, maximize the separation between the different classes. So it's a supervised learning algorithm. In order to look for these directions, mathematically, from the mathematical point of view, we follow a, a similar approach than before. So we center the data, and then what we want to do is to maximize the uh, intervariance uh, the inter, sorry, we want to maximize the interclass variability while minimizing the interclass variability. So we are going to compute a scatter matrix, which is the ratio between the interclass and the interclass. And um, in order to maximize this, this scatter matrix, it's, this uh, amounts to a generalized agent value problem. So I should diagonalize matrix and the etching vectors will give me the directions which better separate uh, the classes. Okay, so principal component analysis and linear discriminant anal analysis are um, two examples of linear techniques. But uh, many times we have our data in, in, in input spaces that are not linear. And here, the, if we process this, this data with linear approaches, um, they will happen, well, strange things, no? It, so we have to look for other kind of approaches. So what we can do is take this uh, input space and this input data and transform it to another space where the data is linear. And then in this new space, I can apply my linear technique, for example, principal component analysis. Now, the nice thing about this is that in order to compute the, the variance in this new space, I, just, uh, I can do it uh, by computing the kernel affinity matrix, which can be obtained directly from the input data. So I do not need to, to explicitly look for this uh, transformation from my input, from my original input space to my, this other new space. And this simplifies things a lot. So in practice, again, we have these three steps of centering the data, then computing the kernel affinity matrix, which in some sense is computing the covariance matrix, and then by diagonalizing it, I can obtain my uh, principal components. Another way of uh, doing dimensionality reduction is uh, manifold learning. Mm -hmm. 
which allow also, uh, which is also nonlinear. Right? Uh, first of all, what is a manifold? A manifold is just a topological space which um, locally looks Euclidean, although it can have a very different global structure. For example, um, the Earth is globally a sphere, a sphere but for us it looks uh, flat because we, in comparison with the Earth, are very small. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea about manifold learning is that the data, which is in a very high dimensional space, lies in fact or is very close to a low dimensional uh, manifold and that we can learn the geometry of this manifold. And how we are going to do that? So we are going to do, so given my, my I have some few samples in this manifold, I'm, I'm, I'm going to construct a um, neighborhood graph. Hmm? This neighborhood graph is an approximation of my manifold. And um, it turns out that the etching functions of the manifold encode the topological and geometrical information of the manifold. So by computing the etching vectors of the graph, I can obtain information about my manifold. And this is what is called the spectral decomposition. So for example, uh, here um, we have a database of faces which uh, all the original, originally these, uh, these are of size 64 by 64, so the, the original dimension would be, if I put all the pixels in a vector, would be 64 by 64. But um, in fact, if I come to think to it, I can try uh, um, to represent this data in a much simpler way. No? For example, there are not so many degrees of freedom, um, basically, um, some of the degrees of freedom there are is the poles, if I'm looking to the right or to the left, and if I'm looking up or down. And also a possible, another um, degree of freedom would be the illumination. No? So here, what uh, we have done is to apply a, a manifold uh, technique to represent this data according to the, uh, they are looking at the left or right, and, and if they are looking top or, or down. Mm -hmm. So they would have a position in this space. But we can see is that this, um, this type of, of data is not, uh, they are not on an Euclidean space, no? not even a, a, a vector space. So we cannot take two objects of, of this manifold and then simply averaging them because it could yield to strange things like that, so something that is not on my manifold. So I have to learn about which is the manifold, and what is more important, I have to learn how to operate the, the operations, I have to define metrics on this manifold to be able to, to operate. This is somewhat related to what Matthew was um, talking before, about uh, doing statistics with large deformation fields. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, is about manifold learning techniques. And the nice thing about all this is that uh, there are many different dimensionality reduction techniques, but most of them can be uh, represented in a, let's say, unique framework core graph embedding. And basically what this framework say is that we have to compute a similarity matrix which encode uh, certain statistical and geometrical properties of the data. And this, led, and this leads to a cost function, uh, the minimization of which can be solved through a generalized eigenvalue problem. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is very nice because we have a unique framework which can be used for a lot of different dimensionality reduction techniques. And um, well, the, the philosophy behind, 
but mainly is that we are going to map nearby samples in my input space to nearby samples in the output space. No? But of course here the tricky thing is how we define this uh, nearby point, no? the distance. So once again, the importance to define the appropriate uh, distance metrics. So basically, uh, what I have is a cost function, a data similarity term, which I have to, sim to minimize. And then uh, typically, we are going to add some regularization to be able to constrain my, my results to functions which are well behaved. So for example, that are smooth. Mm -hmm. And this is just an, an example with uh, regression, huh? where here we would be computing which is the similarity between the predicted and the ground truths. And then we will impose some regularity in order to obtain functions which are smooth. OK, so uh, there are many, many other methods in, in machine learning, which I'm, I'm not going to go into details. But uh, you can find, of course, a lot of tutorials on the web. And also, uh, what is important is that uh, there are a lot of available uh, toolkits and free software um, ready to, to use. One of them is this, stkit-learn, which uh, is a free software in Python, and which allows you to do um, a lot of preprocessing and applying a lot of uh, manifold learning and machine learning um, algorithms. Also, for the optimization part, it's also important to, to be able to, to choose among which kind of optimizer we are going to use. Um, one, one possibility is uh, this, uh, the, the library given C CDX by, by MATLAB. But there are many, there are many others. OK. So uh, another important uh, issue is uh, feature combinations. We have seen before some example of input features that we could use. But a lot of times, we have that we do not only use one type of feature, but, but we have a lot of possible features from which we can learn. And the question is how to combine them. Okay, so usually, the, the more standard approach, although it's very simple, it just, okay, let's put them all together, and maybe we kind of normalize them so that they have the same variance or the same range, but just we concatenate them in, in an input vector and we give this to our learning algorithm. So this is one possibility. Uh, and uh, another, but the, well, okay, the, the bad thing about this is that it uh, does, do not contemplate the possibility that these features might be really of very, very different nature and with very, very different distributions. Huh? So uh, another option, which gives us a little bit of, uh, more of flexibility about this, is to use kernel. No? And more specifically, multiple kernel learning. In multiple kernel learning, what you do is Okay, you have different features you want to combine, and you are going to assign to each of these features a kernel. Mm -hmm. So each kernel could be measuring the similarity of each feature. And then we are going to combine these, these, uh, these kernels. And the algorithm is going to find both uh, with uh, the optimal, let's say, projection to my output space, and also um, the optimal weights of each of these features to the final uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. So originally, the multiple kernel learning was uh, thought for supervised learning uh, algorithms, eh? so basically classification. But there is also uh, the unsupervised uh, learning uh, formulation 
which allows, for example, to study the variability analysis. Yeah? Later on, I will, I will talk a little bit about, about this work. So one possibility to uh, combine features could be multiple kernel learning. Okay? Another um, issue, which is in fact closely related to feature combination, is feature selection. Hmm? So we have to ask ourselves if in fact any or of the features are useful for, for what I want to go, or if all the variables are useful. Right? Maybe some of them are not useful at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what it's about, feature selection, about excluding uh, irrelevant variables. And there are many methods to do that. One possibility is subset selection, where I try to select which is the best subset of among all my possible um, features for my learning task. Another possibility is regul uh, regularization. Mm -hmm. So I can keep um, all my features, but I impose some, I, I make them small, eh? the contribution. So basically, uh, the, the most uh, usual regularization is to use the L2 norm, which is called also rich regression, mm -hmm. or the L2 one norm, and then it's called the Lasso regression. And another way of doing feature selection, of course, is about, uh, using dimensionality reduction, where I'm only going to keep the main, the main uh, uh, features given by, by the dimensionality <laughs> reduction algorithm. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, then another issue is about feature learning. I already comment on that, but that is representation learning. Eh? So uh, learning which is the best representation for my task. And one possible uh, way of doing it is through deep learning. Um, let's assume that we want to, to recognize uh, objects in an image. This might seem a very complex task, so what I can do is to concatenate different layers hmm, of simple uh, recognition, uh, recognition task. So I can start here at the, at the first layer by from, directly from the pixels trying to compute my edges. So this can be just done in by uh, pixel difference. Once I have my, my edges, then I can use these edges to construct contours and borders. So now, in my second layer, I have already my, my contours and, and, and uh, yeah, my contours. Once I have my contours, I can try to construct from them parts of objects. And from this part of objects, at the same time, I can try to recognize uh, the full object, like for example, a car, a person, or, or whatever. So this idea of going from simple to complex by just putting one layer after the other is what is known as, as deep learning. And well, it's true that mm, nowadays, um, there is a lot of uh, research going on on this and applying deep learning to, to a lot of different applications. Okay, so finally I'm going to, to give some, of, some examples of uh, machine learning applied to, to cardiac applications. One of them is this, which was led by Nicolas de Chateau. Uh, and this work was done here at, at UPF. And here the objective was to uh, learn the representation of a pathological motion. And being able also to compute distance among patients. So the, uh, we, we assume that we uh, can learn the, mm, the manifold using a manifold learning technique. Uh, so the idea was that uh, these uh, pathological patterns described 
uh, can be seen as a deviation from normality. Mm -hmm. So every passion was represented by a uh, abnormality, abnormality uh, motion, which are these, uh, these, these kind of things. And um, so once we have learned which is the, the manifold which embed this uh, pathological motion, given a new patient, we could project this passion to the manifold and compute the distance to normality along the manifold. Mm -hmm. And well, this was applied in the context of uh, cardiac uh, synchronization therapy by looking at some typical abnormal motion, which is called uh, septal flash. This is another work where the objective is to be able to classify between <coughs> infarct and, and control. And they do that based on two types of features, uh, shape and motion. The shape is given by the regional thickness at N diastole and N systole. And the motion is uh, represented by a polyaffine transform mm -hmm. of, uh, well, of the motion along, along the cycle. And um, what they do is um, they try it's, a, it's interesting because they try several classification techniques eh, to, this, um, to this input representation. No? So they try which was the classification error rate when using only the, the motion information, when using only the shape information, and when using both of them, either without normalization and with uh, normalization. And also, what, uh, this, this, I think this work is interesting because also what they compare is what would happen if uh, we would do a preprocessing state. So we do a dimensionality reduction uh, previous to applying this uh, polyaffine transform. We, have, we uh, apply principal component analysis or principal laser squares as a preprocessing state. And then we apply again these uh, two polyaffine and regional escape descriptor. And uh, what's interesting to see is that just by applying this preprocessing, the, all the, um, almost all the classification algorithms get uh, better records. Mm -hmm. So the role of preprocessing could be very important. Eh? Uh, this is another work. Um, we, the, where the objective is to the noise image. So um, they, they start with several input images along the cycle, and they assume they are uh, noisy, uh, they are noisy samples, uh, which are embedded in a manifold which is parametrized by motion. Okay? So in fact, along uh, we have this each of these samples would be one of these, eh? and along the, and they are situated uh, in one of these positions, depending on the on which moment on the cardiac cycle they are taken. So from this noisy image, and together with el, uh, the electrocardiogram signal, they estimate which is the manifold eh? on which the unnoised image would be. Mm -hmm. And then they project back to the original input space and they obtain the, the noise input image. Okay. And here there is another example. This work is by Sergio Sanchez, which is a PhD student in, in our group. And uh, here what we want to to, to do is to study uh, myocardial motion patterns to see if the joint analysis of different features can provide us with an insight into the pathology. No? And what we do is we combine different velocity tra traces at uh, rest and, and stress together with some temporal information. And we do this combination 
through multiple color learning, the unsupervised uh, form, uh, form approach, so that we compute the projection to the optimal space, uh, to the output space, having into account the philosophy that I told you before, that nearby input, nearby, uh, input samples in the input space should remain close to nearby outputs in the output space. And we find also, which is the best co uh, combination of the different features for this. Once we are in the output space, we look at the main directions of, uh, of variation. And because we are very interested in, in to study the, the variability analysis, we um, map back uh, to the input space to see the, uh, to the variability. Mm -hmm. And as I told you, what we hope is that this joint analysis uh, provided with some insights into what is happening with these patients. Eh? We apply it to um, hair patients uh, with uh, hair failures uh, with preserved ejection fraction. And, uh, okay. This is another um, application which recently appeared in media. And here the objective is to segment the left ventricle. And they do that uh, first by applying convolutional, convolutional networks to detect where the left ventricle is. Once they have detected, they apply uh, autoencoders to obtain a rough uh, segmentation a rough approximation of the left ventricle shape. And then the, they use this rough estimation to initialize uh, the formable model. And finally, this is another estimation which also appears uh, recently in media, which applies both unsupervised and supervised learning approach to estimate the biventricular volume. So first, they apply an unsupervised representation learning to learn which are the best features to estimate the, the volume. And then they use these features together with a supervised regression forest in order to make the prediction about the uh, volume, the biventricular volume. Okay, so um, there are and many other examples. Just I would like to, to draw the attention to some online tools that you can find, uh, not only tutorials, but also software. And just as a conclusion, while well, saying that, of course, machine learning is being increasingly used in all medical applications, and basically because it offers the flexibility to adapt to the data, so to be able to learn from the data without being explicitly uh, programmed to say at what to look for or, or what to do. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, when building a machine learning algorithm, there are many, many issues that uh, we have to take into account. Perhaps uh, one of the most important are the ones that I put here, so defining the learning task especially what is my training experience, then um, which methods I'm going to use, so which model, uh, the cost functional and the optimization procedure. Mm -hmm. And there is no single method which works best for all problems. And then there are many issues related to evaluating and training the data, uh, which has to do with if I have enough samples to learn, the, the model, if I'm overfitting my model, etc. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I would like to thank some of my collaborators in, in, well, in the work we are doing about machine learning. And well, if you have any questions, I will be happy to, to answer. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this comprehensive overview.
uh, as you partially said already, is like a uh, lot of the problems or a lot of the features in a way in machine learning is that in the end you get extreme good performance. I think it's probably one of the most performant approaches in order to do a specific task, but very often you don't know why it's so performant. So the question is a little bit like, how can we um, in the future also like ensure like, of course, obviously when you need to do a task, then it's a good way of doing. But when you want to do research, and you want to understand something, sometimes you want to know what is the underlying mechanism which is being used, yeah. which are the features is being used. Yeah. So how can we try to improve that? Yeah, it's true that a lot of times um, th mm, these type of algorithms are, uh, let's say, applied blindly, no? without understanding. They are, uh, more and more there are uh, being uh, uh, some researchers that are going into why this is working or not. No? For example, one of them is Stefan Malat, uh, which tried to give an explanation of the deep learning by a specific example, which is the scattering transform. And he tries to give a mathematical justification of why this could happen. But it is a very, very, very specific thing. And, and yes, I think this is really an open, uh, an open field of research. And that most people apply it without having uh, really knowledge of what is going on. Hmm. Uh, there are, and there are some methods that are more propens to that than others. No? Like for example, in multiple kernel learning, you have a little bit more of control of which are the weights you are putting, of which are the kernels that you are using to, to define the similarities. So you are more in control of what is going on. But uh, for example, in com sometimes in, in a lot of uh, neural networks, you really don't understand what is going on behind, behind that. Any other questions? Everybody's hungry. So good, then it's lunchtime now. Let's